Hello, Shumai. Hello, how are you? Um, I'm Ina Lloyd. I'm part of the Good Practice team in the Wales Audit Office. Hello, Ina Lloyd, a doi. Doing rhan o'r team yma'r fe da o'r swydd a'ch gwylio Cymru. So, the webinar you're going to see shortly uh, is from the Behaviour Change Festival at Bristwith. Details of the previous um, festivals at Bangor and Swansea can be seen on the Good Practice uh, Wales website. So, what can you expect from the following webinar? Many Welsh universities are embedding sustainable development principles into the, their everyday life and we thought it might be helpful to share their approaches uh, for the bodies that actually do come under the Wellbeing the Future Gener Generations Act to see if they can share or learn or adapt some of the principles they're undertaking. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Ina Lloyd, I'm part of the Good Practice team in the Wales Audit Office. There's two other members here who are sitting behind the screens. Hello Debrick, hello Bethan, how are you? They're helping to take the questions in from this afternoon. So, without further ado, before I actually go into the webinar, I'd like to introduce the panels, if I may. So, starting on my left, can I ask Tom, would you like to introduce, to introduce yourself? Thank you very much. My name is Tom Yearley. I'm uh, Head of Sustainable uh, Delivery in the University of Wales, Trinity, St David. Um, I've been based here for approximately just, well, just under a year now. Having worked in the higher education sector on sustainability, uh, getting on for the last 10 years. I um, have a strong interest in building business case for sustainability within the higher education sector and also how we can uh, harness behavioural change techniques to really drive uh, environmental impact reduction and um, reducing our impact on climate change. Oh, thank you very much, Thank you. Hello. Hi, I'm Kate Hamilton from the Office of the Future Generations Commissioner. I'm a policy and performance analyst, and in that role, I have a particular responsibility for building our connections with uh, networks of experts. So, in that capacity, I'm our link person to our higher education institutions. Kate, thank you. Hello. Hello. I'm uh, Chris DC. I'm the assistant. HR Director of the Cardiff Met, Cardiff Metropolitan University, and uh, in particular, my, I'm one of the leads for our Health and University Strategy. Thank you, Chris. And last but not least, a lady that's wearing two hats, I believe. Yes, I am. Uh, I'm Amy Lien. I'm Director of Sustainability at Bangor University. Um, I lead the Sustainability Lab at Bangor University, and we are the corporate focal point for everything to do with sustainability at Bangor, with a remit to embed sustainability across everything we do. That's one of my hats. My second hat is that I'm the chair of the Higher Education Wales Futures Ge Future Generation Group, which used to be uh, called Education Sustainable Development. Uh, and that group uh, consists of members from every university in Wales who meet to discuss how we can uh, understand the Future Generations Act better and to collaborate with others who also need to deliver on the Act. So, what can you expect from this webinar? Well, the webinar is going to last just under an hour. I'm going to ask the panel a series of four questions. You're very welcome to take part. And actually, you're not just the audience today, for the first time ever, we have a live audience. Hello, folks. We've never done this before, so it'll be interesting to see how this actually works. So there'll be questions coming in from our live audience from the festival itself and also from yourselves. So how do you ask the questions? A couple of ways you can actually do that. Simple email address, good.practice at audit.wales. Don't wait until I give you a shout out for the questions. If you've got a question, pop it in now. The other one, if you Twitter, if you tweet, sorry, on Twitter there's a hashtag called BehaveFest17. I'll spell it out for you. So it's hashtag B-E-H-F-E-S-T-17. I'm just checking with Debrick that I've actually spelled it out right. Oh, that's good. That's just to make sure then. Okay. So you've kind of got, you know that this is a behavior change festival webinar. You know we're an abolist with, you know this is a third. Sitting on the table are members from the universities, some universities in Wales. We're not part of the Wellbeing of the Future Generations Act currently. So I have to turn to Kate and say, what's the connection there? Help me out here. 
Uh, well, the higher education sector is not uh, bound by the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, but I think from our point of view, they are very much part of the process of delivering on it. Um, in their role as sort of drivers of change, really, in our society, um, the particular uh, responsibilities that universities have around teaching our next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs and decision makers, um, giving students a world view. So, um, both through what they study and through uh, what their student experience is all about, what their life experience is all about. So, there's a huge responsibility there that universities have. Um, of course, there's the, the, the core work of universities in terms of producing research and knowledge, asking the big questions, filling knowledge gaps, um, all of which is really important to the delivery of this act, because this is really something where nobody knows the destination. We have to learn our way there, and, and having our kind of biggest intellectual assets on board in the journey is really important. Um, and in the, the cases of the universities around this table, uh, they're also experimenting with institutional change to fit the demands of the Act. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned there by those public bodies who are bound by the Act from those who aren't bound but are participating because they want to, because they see it's a good thing. Okay, so we keep thank you for that. That's very much. So I guess I think I should ask to go for the very simple question, really. The why question. Tom, can I come to you and say, look, why are you following the spirit of the Act? Thanks, Ina. Um, it was actually the, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act was one of the trigger points for bringing me to Wales uh, in the first place personally. I uh, hear the story that we, we have to start small, we should start at start, a uh, grassroots level and build it up on a regular basis. Um, the legislative framework in Wales has inspired me through its ambition to change the behaviours of the parent nation for the well-being of future generations. And combined with the Environment Act and the Planning Act, this gives us a fantastic springboard for the future. Um, at the University of Wales, Trinity St David, um, our key uh, objective is transforming education, transforming lives. Now, we have a strong reputation, um, strong track record for bringing students from a hard to reach um, social backgrounds into higher education who wouldn't necessarily have had that opportunity in the past. Uh, and that operates alongside internationally significant uh, research on our campuses as well. So we really feel at heart the values of the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. And not only that, but we see it as a key way to define how our departments, how our faculties can deliver and shape our responsibilities as a member of the community um, nationally to help meet these goals that we have chosen as a nation to take forwards. Well, um, Bangor University has a long-standing reputation for its interest in sustainability in our research, in our teaching, the way our location um, in beautiful North Wales and Snowdonia lends itself to asking questions about sustainability on many levels, be it environmental, socially, culturally and economically. Um, however, uh, many people uh, often say, oh, but what do you mean by that? What does sustainability really mean? It's easy enough to say you want to be the sustainable university. Who wouldn't want to be? Uh, and what we found is that the Act has provided us with a fantastic opportunity to explain clearly to people what it really means. It has a sustainable development principle which says that whatever we do should consider the needs of current and future generations to meet their own needs, uh, which is, you know, long-standing since the time of curriculum, but then also to remind us that whatever happens around us, however difficult the financial situation is, there are three other aspects that we can consider apart from the economy, which is people, society, the environment and culture. And culture, of course, means a way of doing things as well as culture in the sense that you would uh, think about it in, in terms of Welsh culture. And then there's a way, the ways of working. 
And when you explain that to people, it's a fantastic tool as project management. Um, and so it's been a great opportunity to consider, can we use this act to do things better and differently than we would be doing anyway? So um, it's great from our perspective that we can elect to do it. Uh, so it's don't have to choose to in our case, and uh, it's proving to be an interesting journey. Can you have more Hello, Chris. Hello. Thanks, Ina. Um, at Cardiff Metropolitan University, we developed a healthy university strategy, which is very much in line with the Future Generations Act. Um, it has aspirations to be environmentally and socially responsible, to be equitable, fair, ethical, uh, to engage our communities, to celebrate our Welsh language and culture. It's in line with the Future Generations Act, but actually the act itself wasn't initially the driver. Um, the driver is for us to be a successful university. And I think the development of being a successful university and the Future Generation Act um, are not mutually exclusive. They actually support each other. And so, as Shane and my colleagues have said, I think that it certainly provides a framework for us to describe and explain what we do at Health and University. Um, so, following the spirit of the Future Generation Act and developing our Health and University uh, strategy further, I think will go hand in hand. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. So, Kate, we have three very different perspectives shared there. So, I guess. From your point of view, what's the value that, that you're seeing after what's hearing what the panel's actually said? Well, I think what, it, what comes across really strongly from all three cases is this sense of, oh, thank goodness, you know, there's somewhere we're trying to go and this is a way we can get there. And I think um, for us, that's a really kind of uh, supportive and, and positive feeling to have around the act. It's very easy for for um, institutions who feel bound by something, just the fact that they're bound by it, perhaps feel less positive about it. But this is, uh, it, it's great to feel the kind of energy and uh, inspiration that goes with choosing to uh, follow the act. Um, and I think it, it means that the universities are able to pursue it in a way that's quite kind of creative and free. And I, uh, I suspect that over time, a lot of really interesting lessons will be learned about how to uh, approach integrating the act into the way these institutions work, which will be valuable for all sorts of other institutions, um, just because of their, you know, their freedom to opt in rather than feeling obliged to meet specific uh, criteria. Okay, thank you. Can I say thank you for your questions already coming in? We've got a couple of talking about the different relationships between the different sectors. So I'm going to read this question out twice to the panel because I haven't heard it yet. So, panel, are you ready for your first question? So, one of the biggest issues seems to be how higher education and public services perceive each other, perhaps with academics being seen as remote from public services. So, how do we bridge this gap? I'm going to repeat it again slowly, give you time by a bit of time. One of the biggest issues seems to be how higher education and public services perceive each other, perhaps the academics being seen as remote from public services. So the question is, how do we bridge this gap? Tom, I'm going to start with you this time, but I promise I will not always start with you. <laughs> so, any thoughts on that question? Yes, indeed. So. I, I would like to think that the academics, uh, the academic staff at the University of Wales, Trinity St David, are approachable individuals and um, share a desire to be involved in the in the provision of local services where their expertise allows. Um, we are passionate about showcasing the skills of our academic staff, of our teaching staff, and of our research staff. And to that end, within our commercial services department, uh, we have specialist staff who act as liaison between third party organisations, whether it be public sector, whether they be private sector organisations, to ensure that that access is granted and um, can be beneficial to both parties. And that, that could range from having students uh, engaged in commercial projects or public sector projects. Uh, we have a number of um, undergraduate and PhD students 
who are sponsored by their employers to come in and work with our academic teams. And that encourages an exchange of knowledge between the, the private or public sector organization and the university. So we, we would welcome any uh, public sector body to get involved, to contact us, and I'm sure we can find the right academic individual to put you in touch with. Yes. So in terms of your university, um, what would the route in for them in terms of St David's? Is there a particular protocol? Uh, yes, there is a particular protocol. Um, I don't have it, so but I'm sure we can put it in the notes what for the... Do? We'll capture that yeah. then and we'll find out by the end of the webinar and we'll add that to the resources if that's okay. Tom, thanks for that. Thank you. Can I come to you on this one? Yes, you can. Um, we've got a very uh, close working relationship with our local authorities. Um, but I think one of the biggest challenges for anybody that's outside a big organisation, and that it, it works both ways, uh, who is the university? Who is the local authority? Where is the front door for the thing that you really want? Mm. Um, and so to that end, we, our research and enterprise office have, uh, have a client relationship manager who has collated information about how what we do with who. Um, and um, with Kunal Winner, for example, there's a vast array of relationships ongoing between various parts of the local authority and many, many of our staff. And um, when senior management and um, senior management from the local authority meet together, one of the things they want to do is to know how to enhance this working relationship. And one of the things that we're considering that's very important is that we listen to each other. So it's easy for a, an external organisation like the authority to be mistaken that it's just a bunch of people who think they're very important. Whereas actually, once you start talking, we suddenly find that there are lots of things that we can learn from the local authority and the best practice that they themselves engage in. Kunal Gwynedd, for example, has a follow the Gwynedd of dealing with their customer base, which is very customer focused and listening to individuals and communities, which is a great way of operating. They also have tackled some of the um, climate change issues that we could, as a campus, or in collaboration maybe with other of the public bodies, learn together and share some skills and expertise. So it's not always a one-way then to us. It's very much a two-way dialogue that we want to support, but again, with this bad relationship management uh, so that we can keep track and that people don't beat a trade to the different people beating a trade to the door of the same people, if you know what I mean. But it's, it's streamlined to the best effect on four both sides. So coming back, I came back to the top. Is it a particular sort of point of contact? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to mention a name, Trevor Wynne Jones, at the Research and Enterprise Office, would certainly be an individual who could uh, bring it to the attention of the right people. Can we have that name check again? And Beth, can we pick up this name if that's all right? And also, can we, did you say Fourth Gwynedd? Fourth Gwynedd is the way of doing okay. things in Gwynedd. It's okay. the way they, the local authority okay. operates. Well. And we should well. probably find that and come up with it. Yes, we will. Mm -hmm. We need to find that. Thank you. So the name check is Trevor Wynne Jones, um, Founder University's Research and Enterprise Office. Again, I don't know the exact website, but it should be, it's definitely on there. I just don't have memorised it on the plate. We'll find that out and can come and check Hello, Chris. So, mm -hmm. yes, uh, so well, I think you've got a very good relationship with our local authority and our Council Council. Um, some examples of, of where we have opportunities to share our expertise and uh, learn and work together would be things like uh, sustainable transport, mm -hmm. sustain, sustainable travel, mm -hmm. um, some of the goals under the livable Cardiff um, uh, is to try and change the, uh, the way people travel and commute around the city. Uh, within Cardiff Met, we're really keen also to improve our sustainable and active travel. So there's a, an alignment there between uh, the local fog and ourselves. So, with engaging in conversations where we can perhaps um, uh, help through things like we have a dedicated um, 
students um, and staff uh, bus uh, transport and called Net Rider, which can also provide is out there in the community, so it can also provide um, a, uh, a service to the local community as well, which again helps with um, the city's goals. We've also um, have a particular interest in working with public health, so public health workers, uh, in sharing some of the expertise that we have in-house. We have a, a school of health science, we have a, a school of sport, both of those are doing a lot of research work as well as a lot of practical and applied things that they, they can work with the local authority on. And of course we also in Cardiff have uh, something called like Sport Cardiff where the university provides uh, a lot of the sport and um, uh, sort of active activity for the, the community of Cardiff as well. Okay. Very nice, thanks Just So Kate, wearing the future gen of this hat, Given what the response has been from the panel here, what would your thoughts be? Uh, the first response is a great question because I think it's uh, it's really important to think about if we want this uh, this journey, this expedition that we're on, to be a collaboration between what universities are learning and what other public bodies are learning. Then we need to be able to bridge those divides uh, or those yeah those distinctions. So. Uh, I'm just very encouraged to hear that there are these existing models that we can build on that uh, that will enable some sort of I, th I think there's a place for some sort of accompaniment relationships or sort of you know co-mentoring relationships between the two types of institutions and I think it, um, uh, getting over those sort of perception differences and we're in different sectors and we don't have anything in common is is, uh, is an important part of that with public institutions and, and learning from each other is the way forward. I like that call mentioned bit really nice and so thank you for that. Thank you. We've got a couple more questions coming in panel. So again I'll do the same thing. I'm gonna read it out twice. Amy I think it's only fair I come to you first on this one because poor Tom I'll be coming to uh, twice now. So the HE sector has a lot of knowledge of what works and what doesn't for sustainable development. Yeah, top point. Public services are keen to learn, so is there anything practical that you could do to help improve the sharing of knowledge? So I'll um, read that once again to give you some time to have a think. The HE sector has a lot of knowledge of what works and what doesn't for sustainable development. Public services are keen to learn, so is there anything practical that you could do to help improve the sharing of knowledge? I will start, mm -hmm. and if I can't finish, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, because, uh, of, yes, it's very true that there is a big repository of knowledge within HE, and we are exploring about what works and what doesn't. But in any engagement, I think um, Tom earlier on mentioned core business. And I think um, a lot of the frustrations of engaging with HG is that some of this engagement gets in the way of core business. And we're busy delivering on teaching, research, enterprise, and so on. But there isn't enough time to be able to engage meaningfully with the people who need to get involved. That's my start at the 10. And maybe somebody else can help me out, and then maybe there's time for them. Okay. Just so you have people need to come to you, I will have to miss a thing for this one. Yeah, a couple more minutes. Okay. So I'm then I'm going to come to you on this one then. Thank you. Uh, without being facetious, um, pick up the phone and give me a call. I'd be happy to have a discussion um, with someone about how we've managed sustainability um, in the higher education models that I've had. Um, I, as, as we've been discussing with our colleagues here today, um, I love the fact that in the higher education sector we are very open and we do share our sustainability initiatives broadly throughout the sector. Um, the very fact that we're here today on a behavioural change workshop is a fine example of how that is uh, how that's manifested. Um, in the higher education sector, we're also very keen to share our learning and knowledge uh, by all types of social media and, and traditional media, whether it be our websites where we're always very keen to publicise internal staff engagement opportunities, 
whether it's through uh, initiatives such as uh, through YouTube or through our Twitter feeds. Um, this time of year is a very good time of year to uh, look and see what higher education establishments are doing as we've just uh, finished our national, our nationwide NUS Go Green Week, which is a fantastic showcase of how university, not only academic areas, uh, but also students and professional services who support those activities come together for a week of celebrations on uh, sustainability initiatives and plan our journey for the upcoming year. So I think there's a number of ways in which you can access the experience uh, that we've had in the higher education sector. It's a matter of choosing the right media for you. Thanks, Tom. And I just remember we had a conversation earlier on this morning. We were talking about some of the activities around when students are, are, are finish the academic year, mm -hmm. what's happening in university particularly, to ensure that you're sort of uh, ensuring that students will be responsible when they leave their, their houses, the student houses, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I've not heard of any other projects exactly like yours. Maybe you want to share that particular one? Uh, I'd like to do. Can I just go back to what Tom, Tom gave a great answer actually. Yes. Um, and I would agree, pick up the phone. Um, but I would also say that that's been there for quite some time and finding the right front door, as I mentioned earlier, is the big challenge. Um, Ina mentioned some work we're, we're doing with Honor residents uh, and that's to make with several initiatives from our halls team. Uh, who have really embraced the idea of sustainability and well-being and actually appointed a sustainability champion to really move forward with this and to work with the sustainability lab. And there's a big give at the end of term. There's um, halls to homes where people who are moving from halls this year into the community will um, get to learn about what the rules of engagement in the community are. So if you've been used to living in a hall, then you've had your recycling taken care of and this and that taken care of. Whereas actually when you become part of the community, uh, you have to behave differently. Um, there's um, Bangor and a budget when you come from home, how, how you're going to manage yourself, how you're going to work together with your fellow students to save money on food, reduce waste, um, love your clothes, you hate waste, all sorts of initiatives around halls um, to effect behaviour change in a way and also use some of our psychology students who were part of the first Bangor um, uh, Behaviour Change Festival to provide nudges. In fact, this week in my office, we're working with um, some psychology students to see whether there are nudges in the office that can encourage um, better eating habits. I'm not there myself, but they come around to look at our little kitchen and I think they're gonna supply some fruit <coughs> and water or whatever, but we've got to keep a diary of what we're doing. So another example, giving students opportunities to learn and then they will share. In the past, they had a, a D fruit shop in town, wow. encouraging uh, the town uh, people to um, may, you know, to not be put off by a misshapen carrot or whatever is usually rejected. So, and we also had a shop in the high street uh, with in uh, partnership with that and the clothes. So and there are things like that. Because, but, but I think the finding the front door is the biggest challenge for people. It's not that behind that door, as Tom says, and behind the social media, we're there. And I think for public sector bodies in particular, uh, at the University of Wales, Trinity St David, we uh, have campuses in three or even four um, public service board areas within Wales. And we are strong supporters of the environmental subcommittees within those groups. And I would strongly encourage you to take part in those fora to not only learn from what we're doing in the higher education sector, but also to learn from what our colleagues across the public service, uh, public services, are engaged with. There's there's an enormous wealth of knowledge and information to be sourced from those groups. Excellent. Chris, are you coming from Metaphor uh, first? They've got a bit of a farmers market starting tomorrow. Yes, obviously. I guess another way is by encouraging the community to, to come onto campus. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, tomorrow we've got our first uh, farmers market. 
um, something we're hoping to keep with on, on each of our campuses going forward at least uh, once a month. Um, I think also uh, how people can find out about some of the work that goes on in universities which they may be able to learn from under the positive uh, uh, activity that's happened or learning lessons from mistakes that perhaps in the universities we made is through looking out for things like public lectures uh, where people are invited to for the outcomes of research that's been undertaken. Um, I think in we all, whichever university we we do tend to like to shout about the sorts of things that we do. So I think there are opportunities for, for people to look out and come on. And, and also as well, um, we often, you often see um, uh, people from across the universities in Wales at uh, various events which are open to the public where they may be giving presentations again explaining some of the um, uh, the things that have, that have happened on the university, the university too. So I think there are opportunities there for people uh, to, to seek out. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I'm conscious of time. I've got one more question before we move on. Before we move on. So again, I'm going to read it out twice. Um, language forms the basis of our understanding and both public and higher education are full of jargon. How do you ensure that we're on the same page? And do you have any examples of behaviour change to support sustainable development from your university? So there's two separate questions coming in. So first question, I'm just going to let Damien know and then I'll come to the kind of first on this one. Language forms the basis of our understanding and both public services and higher education are full of jargon. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. So how do you ensure that we're on the same page? That's the first question. And um, Chris, just to let you know, I'm going to uh, come to you first on this next question. Do you have an example of behaviour change to support sustainable development from your university? I'll ask all three, all three of you the question, but I'm just giving you a heads up. So, Amy, language, oh, jargon. Jargon must be. Being on the same page is often jargon, isn't it? <laughs> 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 no, that's said. Um, I think it's a constant battle. Um, because it's shorthand. And I often find myself falling into jargon because it's easier and I don't realise that I'm doing it. So I think one of the um, ways is, do you know, if you hear somebody falling into jargon, put your hand up and say, excuse me, I don't understand what you're saying. One of my colleagues, um, a very eminent professor, said that from his supervisor, he learnt a very important thing, which is, don't be afraid to say, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And it takes a big person to put your hand up and say, I don't understand. But it's a, a reminder for the rest of us. Um, it's not very clever to talk in parables if there's nobody there to interpret them for you. So it, we, should, we should be thinking um, always, actually, um, my team and I are always very conscious of it. Do, we, do people really understand what we're trying to say here? And, and we are really trying with communications. Um, I do an internal audit of our environment management system and the systems, and every month we come up with communication, communication, communication. You're right, language is very much part of that, um, but we also need to, we, we need to work on it very hard, I'd say. And I apologize to everybody. Oh, okay. <laughs> or, for big words. Thank you. I try very hard not to, but I Definitely think it well. is a point well made about even things. Definitely. Can I have on this one if that's okay? Uh, merely to say that I would agree entirely. If you've got a question, put your hand up. On a practical basis, I would suggest we are a dual language university, English and Welsh. And I'd say other languages um, such as Chinese are increasingly important to us. Um, to overcome those those language and cultural challenges, I would say, lead by example, actions speak louder than words in many cases, and visualise wherever possible the key tools in the behavioural change toolkit. I'm just going to have a couple of questions coming through about uh, long term. Could I, whoever's forward me that question on regarding long term, could I ask you to clarify that if that's okay? Thanks very much. Hello, Chris. Mm -hmm. So, what's Cardiff Nets uh, on jargon? Uh, well, we never use TL, uh, TLEs. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's three letter abbreviations. 
And about the question was about the examples of yeah. um, sustainable development yes. activity. I, th I think one that I'd like to share is uh, what we do, Game Guardian uh, Sustainable Travel, and um, active travel in particular. Okay. Uh, so we really look to encourage both staff and students to uh, to um, travel to and from work and study um, sustainably encouraging people not to use their cars, so we do a whole range of things, um, encouraging people to cycle uh, and to walk or use the uh, public transport. And um, to further encourage that, we have uh, regular events where people um, are either, in, either encouraged to, perhaps because they don't normally um, uh, come to work sustainably, or to reward them for regularly coming to work sustainably, we have things like whether free healthy breakfasts. Oh, so, um, so people for a week, sometimes two weeks, are encouraged to uh, to ensure that they, they come in on the bike or more public transport, and then there's uh, vouchers that they then can transfer then at our local eateries uh, into some healthy breakfasts. Um, I think that what we Another one along those active travel is, is we, we have some projects and one that's really useful, which was a, a, sort of a, um, a step into action, a sort of pedometer challenge to encourage people to measure the amount of uh, steps that they take. And I'm sure every university has done the same thing. And we use the British Heart Foundation's 10,000 steps a day as, a, as an example of a, of a norm. Where we found what we found most useful of all uh, when we come to uh, evaluate uh, that sort of project was not so much the, uh, the, the distance that we travelled and, and that people were able to map, but actually how we highlighted to a lot of staff and students how sedentary their life yeah. actually is. Mm -hmm. And when measuring against the 10,000, we identified that the step count was so low, but what it actually led to was some sort of lifestyle change where they then took it upon themselves to do more walking, when it might be walking the dog, walking to the uh, to to use the stairs instead of the lift, etc. So I think there's there's a number of those sorts of projects that happen in the universities and they can be worthwhile sharing. Okay, thanks for that. I'm conscious of time. Deb, has a question on um, on long term come back in? I want to give you a shout when it does then if that's all right, thank you. So I'm gonna ask the panel now to think about it's ten years time, it's twenty twenty seven. I wonder what success would look like in the universities then in terms of what we did in the context of behaviour change and in, in terms of the spirit of the well-being, the Future Generations Act. So Tom, get the crystal ball out for me. It's 2027. What would it look like? What, what would success look like for you? Success for, for me and I think success for the University of Wales, uh, Trinity St David, in 10 years would merely be for individuals to be able to understand the impact that personal actions have on our climate, on the economy, on the, um, the way that we work and the world around us. Uh, for me, the case is so compelling once we have that knowledge that we would not, not be able to act. Um, and coupled with that knowledge of our impact on particularly the environment and climate change is good examples of best practice to follow. So leading or following on from a couple of the questions that we've had, um, knowing that you're causing an impact, knowing that you've got the ability to make a change, but also knowing what you can do to best affect that change. If we can share that knowledge and understanding with staff, students and the community, I would see that as a vision of success in 10 years' time. Well, by 2027, uh, we will be on a third um, strategic plan. So we're halfway through one, and then there'll be another one in 2020, 2025, so we'll be on the third one. We've already, in this current month, um, said we want to be the sustainable university, and it's well. Um, represented across the uh, strategic plan of Bangor University currently. But as we move forward, in 10 years' time, I would want to see the vision 
of sustainability as described in where the future generations are embedded through the institution like words through a stick of rock so that there was no real need to have a special department doing anything more than keeping people updated and current in what's going on uh, that everybody that would be the way we do things we the university will have a top level vision based on the sustainable development principle that we would be addressing the um, economic, social, environmental, and cultural pillars, the five ways of working embedded and the goals equally addressed. Now we are in, we are um, probably uh, currently the most bilingual university uh, in the world. Uh, I would like to think that that has spread across ways that everybody would, would embrace that part of the goal as, as much as all the uh, other goals as much as the others. So really that's what I would think, that all job descriptions include um, a reference to this is the way we do things in Bangor, the PDRs reflect it, that people are promoted and encouraged to work in this way um, so that it's the norm. And it's the Bangor way of doing things. Okay. Nice standing up there, the Bangor way of doing things. I like that. Okay. So, Chris, in terms of cosmetics, 2027, mm. what will success look That's like? That's two excellent answers, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, to follow that. Um, I think for cosmetics, 2017 or 2027, success, what that could look like would be um, the seeing healthy university, our healthy university strategy goals and the future generation uh, uh, act goals being embedded in, in what we do and um, in, in everyday activity really. I think that's that would be what success looks like for us. And I think also we could add to that it would be that, that the people around our university, whether that be the, the staff or the students or, or the wider community were impacted, actually by then feel that actually they're, they're part of the solution as well. They're actually the part of this. Yeah, and so that it, you know, it isn't something that is done to them, but actually something that they actually can contribute to. And I think that's for me that's what the Future Generation Act offers. Thank you. Okay, you talked earlier that sort of universities are actually producing the employees for tomorrow the public services tomorrow. So given the great three great answers we've actually had what difference would this make from your perspective, from, from the Future Gen's office? Um, I think it would make a huge difference. If, we, if, if that's where we are by 2027, I, I think we're well on our way to something very positive. We're talking about changed ways of thinking. We're talking about this being the norm. We're talking about everyone understanding how they're part of the solution. Um, I think what strikes me is, is 2027 is not that far away. You know, that is very much step one. And what I'm really interested in I mean, I am interested, but what I'm also interested in is, you know, and then what, and then what, and then what, you know, so 2027, kids who are adolescents at the moment will be going through university. What about when their kids are going through, or their kids? You know, what will be the role of the university in our uh, sustainable future, um, you know, uh, when society has changed, when this has become normal, not just in our institutions, but as part of our social norms? Um, I'm not really sure I'm expecting an answer right now, but I think it's uh, I think the universities have a really important role to play in pushing us to think that far ahead and to get better at looking into the really long term future um, and getting out of this mindset that actually ten years is a long time. It's not, is it? <laughs> it really is. The way you've just put it there, it really isn't. Tom, Amy, Chris, do you want to come back and add some further thoughts on what Kate's actually said there? Well, um, I agree that 10 years is not a long time, but given the funding cycles and stuff are in three years, I think there needs to be a think outside the university sector about what long term means. Okay. Um, and I think that's quite important because a lot of the things that we do are constrained by funding from elsewhere that drives the short term mentality. Mm -hmm. You've developed it in Bangor, which is called the Bangor way of, of, of um, working. Well, we want to. I wouldn't say that we are there by any means, but it's certainly a, a, an ambition, yes. And the phrase you said this morning that you bought the ticket. 
oh yes, there is a journey and we have bought the ticket. Yes, I like that one. That's a really <laughs> nice one. Okay. Folks, thank you very much for your, uh, for your questions. But a couple of you sent me questions in on long term. Can you clarify what you actually mean for that for me? And as soon as you send them, send them back, Deb, will post them on. Deb, when you get those questions to come back in, will you, will, you, will you post them for me? Chris, if you've got any other ones as well, can you post them for me as well? That's okay, thanks very much. So, um, <coughs> I guess the next question for me is, is, it's time for you to sing from the roofs now and share some of the great things that you're doing, thinking about the audience who's going to be listening in. Um, I, what I want to ask you, is there anything that you could share with other public services that would help them in the challenges that they've got in terms of the Wellbeing Future Generations Act? So, Tom, thinking about there are 44 bodies that cover a very wide range of public services, everything from health, local government, fire, devolved bodies, we've also got certain uh, sort of, um, I've missed out of, uh, I'm on the ministries of ministers' offices as well. So. Thinking about those listening in to you today, can you phrase your responses with their with their in mind, if that's okay? Indeed. Thank Thanks. You. Um, it's about focusing on your strengths. Um, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, in its very nature, is a wide-ranging, hopefully all-encompassing piece of legislation that we will all have a unique way of answering to. Um, at the University of Wales, Trinity St David, we are developing a tool internally that we hope to roll out outside of the organisation, which enables us to undertake our, our project planning process. So how we act, the actions that we will take within our commercial departments, whether it be marketing, finance, facilities management operations, whether it be our, our faculties, and they might range from the performing arts through to business, through to anthropology. Um, and we've established a way based on the um, Wellbeing and Future Generations Act to frame our projects in a way that reflects the ways of working so that we embed, if not all, in every project, at least some in most of the ways of working in the ways that we work. It's obviously only early days, we've been doing this for about 18 months now, um, but what it does is highlight the patterns, highlight where we're stronger, highlight which indicators we're able to perform well against, and highlights which parts of the act maybe we need to think about partnerships with, externally or internally, and think about how we can develop knowledge and understanding of that within our organisation. So this is this is under development at the moment, and it's participating in events like this that really gives us that exposure outside of the higher education, outside of the university environment, for us to learn how other organisations are um, undertaking their responsibilities under the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. As we've touched on already, higher education authorities are not bound under the Act currently, but we find it an incredibly useful tool and an incredibly useful framework to base our activities on so that in the future we are aligned to other public service providers and we are, well, living in the Wales that we want, essentially. Mm -hmm. Nice answer, thank you. I like it bringing back together the Wales we want. Thanks for that, Tom, thank you. So, you know, well, um, I thought the question was, what would people take from this? Yes, happy to take that one, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I thought we'd heard enough about Bangalore on our everybody. I think what I would really <coughs> like to say is that what we are doing in Bangor is um, building something that fits us not looking and comparing too much with other people, but I think what is it that we really need in order to play our part in the way as we want? Um, and to, like Tom says, work to our strengths and, um, and make it fit. And within the institution, again, using the Wellbeing Act as a framework to challenge everybody to see where they fit in, into it. And so everybody else, I would say, have the confidence to be yourselves 
and just see and ask the question, what is my contribution or what is my organization's contribution? Uh, because at the moment, is I would say, a lot of fragmentation rather than integration, a lot of competition rather than collaboration, and a lot of disengagement rather than involvement. That's a challenge for us, and it's also a challenge for everybody else. So, uh, so let's think together about how we can do that for us internally and also for our collaborators to have the confidence and to think we're not in competition. We are working together towards the way that we want. Okay, definitely. Thank you. Chris, can I come to you? Yeah, and I guess as a follow on to that, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, Cardiff Met very keen to follow the spirit of the Future Generations Act. And um, we're not on a bone to have to report, so it's possibly easy for us to say, but, but I would suggest for others who perhaps do have to report under that the Wellbeing Act is actually to still look at the spirit of the Future Generations Act rather than see it as something that's about compliance. So it's not about ticking the box, I think it's about genuinely looking at yourselves and identifying what you're doing in your public service that is within the spirit of the Future Generations Act. Um, and I'm confident that you'll find that there is an awful lot of good things that you're actually doing. And what it will enable you to do, in my view, is it will actually enable you to perhaps start celebrating and um, uh, showing sort of a positive light on a lot of the good work that's done in public services, which perhaps otherwise doesn't get highlighted. There will also be areas where you can you will identify that perhaps you need to improve. But again, that's what the spirit of this Future Generations Act is, is about, I think. So I, I think you know, that, that's what I would suggest. Thanks, Chris. Kate, three very different universities, three very different views on how they're taking the spirit of the act forward. So in terms of the challenges, what, what's the sort of lessons, what's the learning here for public services? Um, well, the first thing I, I want to say, I just I'd strongly endorse that, that focus on the spirit rather than the letter. I think that's very much the way the commissioner has sought to set up um, the work of our office over this uh, you know, first term of this act being in force. And, and I, I think there's a lot to be learned from the ways in which you're you're doing that um, along with that whole uh, approach of really understanding your own strengths and weaknesses, your own contribution, celebrating the bits you know that where your institution has something really interesting to offer, and looking at the areas of relative weakness as opportunities to learn. So I think all of that is very much. Um, very much true of the institutions who are bound by the Act, as much as it is of universities, and it's uh, there's a lot of scope for kind of collaboration of sharing those sorts of. We well, use a lot of journey metaphors, that we expeditions, <laughs> this expedition that we're on uh, together. And I think there's really interesting stuff to learn as well. I mean, one of the things that struck me today is just how much of what these universities are doing falls outside what those of us who don't work in universities would see as the core business you know it's not about necessarily just the teaching or just the research it's all the other stuff and um that for me i think um points to some interesting ideas about where the scope for change might lie and where the scope for uh, experimentation might lie so i'm finding this very hot thank you there we are folks i'm going to answer it. thanks kate Okay, I've had the long-term question back in, folks. Right, okay. So, um, one of the five ways of working is long-term thinking. Public services are thinking about what this means and how they demonstrate it. Anything you can say that would help them? I'm going to re repeat it, just to make sure that I've got it right. One of the five ways of working is long-term thinking. Public services are thinking about what this means and how they can demonstrate it. Anything you can share that would help them. So I'm looking to the panel now. I don't, don't want to be suggesting any particular names to it. Try and help and support me here. Inge? Uh -huh. I'm looking the other way. <laughs> 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 um, well, um, again, I think that you have to take the time to have the conversation yourself. Mm. That your remit, your 
bag is huge. If you're a local authority in particular, or if you're a health board, or wherever you are, um, three years, seven years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, all of those are on the spectrum of long term. And it's, you have to decide uh, where, the, where the lines are. Um, it depends, of course, I think it depends on the topic you're discussing. I think like one of the commissioners emerging themes is population change. <coughs> you know, how are we going to deal with an aging population? Yeah. How long is that? How long is long? What are we going to do with a changing demographic? Um, so that's one area of long term. If you're thinking about, um, well, whatever else, uh, dog mess or whatever topic is also on the list of a local authority or uh, car parking in health trust, whatever they are, there are different levels of long term and short term. And it's for you to have that discussion. I think there is no right or wrong answer. Mm -hmm. uh, in a university, a generation is three years. Yeah. There's a big turnaround. Mm -hmm. But we don't think in terms of just the three years, every three years, you know, there are different levels of long and short term. And I think don't get, I think the message here is don't get stuck in any sort of rut. You know, don't think that's long term, so I've got to go for it. How the flexibility and the confidence, well, that's long term. In this context, it's something different. Okay, thank you. Tom, Chris, please don't be offended. I'm conscious of time. We've got five minutes left. Because I'd like one key message from you for now uh, before we sign off. Thinking what you've heard this afternoon and some of the key messages. If you're listening in and you're part of 44 Bodies and sort of, you know, they all have different parts of their journey in terms of getting, uh, uh, in terms of where being future generations are. What's the one key message that you'd want to share with them? And I'd like brevity on this if that's okay. So, Tom? One message. Yes, um, one key message. As we're talking about behavioural change, the most important element of behavioural change, in my opinion, is helping people to understand that they have the ability to affect change. In jargon terms, you, you might call that uh, they have perceived control over the situation. And in order, to, um, in order to demonstrate that, I find it useful to set ambitious long-term targets but to regularly celebrate success and to re regularly celebrate success by sharing how we've achieved that success to demonstrate that as, a, as an organization, as a community, we are able to make positive steps towards that desire to change. Tom, thank you. Thanks. Ian, for looking, can I catch you for the last time? Okay, um, well, I think that there's a lot to be um, looking forward to it. Um, there's a big opportunity here. And I think that we um, we need to do the small things and see where we fit into the big picture. But we need to all be able to contribute to the big picture too. Um, but don't underestimate your part in it. Nobody is insignificant. Everybody's significant. Yes, and for me, I think the message would be um, to make it people centered, challenge disengagement, open up conversations, get people involved, win hearts and minds. Easy to say, difficult to achieve. I think that should be the goal if we want long term success. Okay, thank you. So, Kent, from the European Future Generations Office, some big messages today. Is there something you want the, the delegates to focus on starting point? There's always a starting point or journey, isn't it? I didn't mean to cut them on the, uh, on the same point again, but what's the starting point for them? Um, I, I think the thing that I'm hearing from this discussion that I'm finding particularly powerful is something about this, there isn't one size that fits all. Yeah. There's something about find the sort of authentic way forward that works for yeah. where you're at and is a step for you, that's the only way we're going to go on this expedition <laughs> journey. Um, and there was also a very strong message around bridging and building relationships. Um, you know, 
silos, divides are never helpful, and the sort of academic <coughs> public policy, you know, that's not helpful either. So something about, you know, uh, let's find ways to take these steps to build those relationships and start the conversations, not because universities have all the answers, but because their business is learning, and what we need to do here is learn together. So let's get into those partnerships now and learn together rather than, um, you know, just sort of expecting them to have the answers and, you know, us to be able to ask the questions and get those answers uh, without doing the work, if you like. So those are two of the big things I've heard. Um, in terms of uh, where we're at at the moment, we're, we're currently having this conversation um, about where the commissioner's work over her term and the work of our office should focus in, in her six year term. So there are, uh, there's an invitation there, whether you're university, public body, citizen, whoever you are, <laughs> to engage in that conversation and help inform our thinking really about what the big future challenges are uh, and, and drilling down into some detail there to help us make an agenda for change over this term that can really make a difference. So one of the things I would leave you with is please join that conversation. Um, the best way to join it is to go to our website, futuregenerations.wales, and it's under the Get Involved page. Uh, you can find what you need there, so please do that. Beth, can we make sure that that link's a little bit better? Great, thank you. So I'd like to draw this webinar to a close now. This webinar is part of the Behaviour Change Festival. As I said right at the beginning, there's already been one in Vanguard and in Swansea. We will share those links with you. Do you to me a webinar man or eagle eye? Thank so thanks everyone who's taken part today. Thank you very, very much indeed. So this is Ina Lloyd on behalf of the Good Practice Team of the Wales Audit Office signing off is saying thank you very much and good afternoon.